Hi, I'm Mary Lake. I would like you to know a little bit about my life. I was born in 1909, in Colonia Dublon, Chihuahua, Mexico, to William Bailey Lake and Sarah Emma Carroll. I do not have any photos of my early years but this photo shows my parents and older siblings a few months before I was born. The poor Mexicans in northern Mexico were rebelling against mistreatment by wealthy landowners and government troops were sent in to suppress the rebellion. After Grandpa Willard Carroll died in 1906, Grandma Charlotte and Uncle Tom's family moved to Grayson, Utah. My parents decided to also leave Mexico. In 1910 they packed up our wagons and moved to Grayson. The town was only five years old. By 1914 the town changed its name to Blanding and claimed a population of 500 people. I loved the teachings I received at the new Blanding Elementary School and at the San Juan High School. I especially loved music. My father purchased a piano that the Butts family had freighted to bluff. My older sister, Lottie, and I would play the tune over the waves over and over again. I was growing up, I developed a deep faith in my Heavenly Father and the restoration of the Gospel. I continued my music practice and served as the organist for the Blanding Ward. Edward P. Kimball, the tabernacle organist, came to Blanding for a state conference and taught a class for organists. Occasionally I was asked to sing in sacrament meetings as a special musical number. Upon graduation from high school, Grant Lee Shumway began courting me. Our courtship was hampered because of a spring epidemic of mumps and measles which many people in Blanding became sick with. I had both diseases at once and was very ill for some time. Lee was very much in love with me, and would come each evening to sit by my side. After I recovered we made marriage plans. In August of 1927 Lee borrowed his father's car and we drove to Salt Lake. Lee was age 21 and I was age 18. On the 16th we were endowed in the Salt Lake Temple and sealed for all eternity by Elder Joseph Fielding Smith. We returned to Blanding where we lived with my parents until we were able to get our own home. Lee was able to make bounty money by trapping coyotes during the winter from October to February. In August of 1928, Lee helped my parents move to Oakley, Utah. Then he returned again to Oakley, with me so I could be with my mother when our first child, Grant L. Shumway, was born on November 8, 1928 in the lake's little log house. Upon my return to Blanding, I continued to serve in the Blanding ward and in August of 1929 was called to serve as second counselor in the primary. The next year on September 22, 1930 another son was born. We named him Devan Lake Shumway. One week after Devan's birth, Lee and his brother, Harris, left to go to the Navajo Reservation to check their trap lines. Two days later I became very ill and died. Two brothers, Glenn and Seth, went hunting for Lee and Harris and found them about 25 miles south of Kayenta, Arizona. Blood poisoning took my life just nine days after I delivered Devan. Dr. Sherman had lost eight women in birth and for this reason his license was revoked. It was such a sad time for all the families involved. The Lake family traveled to Blanding for the funeral and burial of their beloved daughter. My funeral was held in the Blanding Tabernacle and my primary children sang a song called Your Sweet Little Rosebud Has Left You. Here is a sample of the music. Eliza R. Snow wrote the words for a tune by Ebenezer Beasley.
was buried in the Blending Cemetery on the 3rd of October. My last words were concern for my sons. Grant remained in Blending with his father who had moved in with his parents. When the Lakes returned to Oakley, Devan went with them and lived with them until he was married. Grant also spent many years living with relatives in Oakley. I am eagerly looking forward to the day when I can hold my beloved husband and two boys in my arms again. Hi, I'm Grant Lee Shumway. I was born February 28, 1906 in an adobe home in a rural area of San Juan County, New Mexico called Jewett. It is now known as Waterflow. I am shown here in 1972 standing by a wall of the home I was born in. Six of my older siblings were born in Arizona and the others were born in New Mexico where my father owned 160 acres of land. The water in the canal, shown in the background, came from the river and had fish in it. The youngest photo of me shows me with my mother, Mary, and sister Ruth. I am the person in the upper right of this photo. I was the eleventh of twelve children of Peter Minerly Shumway and Mary Elizabeth Johnson. In 1910, father sold our New Mexico home, bought additional cattle, and moved our family to Grayson, now called Blanding, San Juan County, Utah. This map shows our estimated travel path. We followed the San Juan River so our livestock had access to water. The trip of about 125 miles took 11 days. Initially we lived in tents in Westwater Canyon on the west side of town. Eventually Dad built a rock house on homesteaded land in Recapture Canyon, about 15 miles south of town. Here I am by our old rock house with my daughter Carol Ruth and Rex's two children Andrew and Becky. The area is called Fiddler Green. We raised horses and cows here and also had an alfalfa field, a fruit orchard and a garden. We had so much milk mother made cheese for sale. One fall my father and some older boys took our buggy and went to New Mexico for supplies. Mother felt unsafe because of the Indians. They had been watching from the surrounding cliffs and stealing things like watermelons. Mother decided we should walk to the bluff road and catch a ride to Blanding. One of our little lambs followed us. We were able to catch a ride with the mail wagon driven by my future father-in-law, Bailey Lake. We and stopped living in recapture. We had a home in town and homesteaded farmland four miles south of town. This photo shows the old rock home in 1952. My son, Rex and his cousin, Dwayne, are in the doorway. My son, Kay took the photo. Over the years spring floods in Recapture Canyon washed away the east side of the building. Kay helped restore the old house in 2017. This photo shows Kay standing by the restored building. When I was young many coyotes visited our homestead at night. I remember hearing them in the orchard cracking open peach pits to eat the nuts. At age eight I was baptized a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints by John D. Rogers in a little reservoir on the northeast side of town and later confirmed by President Lemuel H. Redd. One day at school during recess Mr. Hyde from Bluff let us kids ride in his new 1912 model car. This photo shows him in Bluff giving rides. I became enamored with mechanical equipment. In 1918 my father, Peter, bought a new Buick car. It was tricky to get started because when one person turned the engine with a hand crank another person had to adjust the gas throttle and the spark timing. In this car my parents went to visit relatives in Cache Valley, Utah and Shumway, Arizona and took my younger brother, Glenn, and me. This photo shows the old schoolhouse in Shumway, Arizona south of Snow Flake. At age 12 I was ordained a deacon in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints by Albert R. Lyman after which I helped gather produce donated as fast offerings by the ward members. I attended eight grades of school and then began learning the art of trapping from my expert brother, Seth. Seth was an official government trapper. 
Seth was asked to kill the wolves that had been feeding on cattle south of the bear's ears. Seth and I took pack animals, guns, food, including a jar of sourdough starter and successfully went after the wolves. It took about a month. Like my brothers I was blessed with a strong athletic body. I could throw a rock across the San Juan River and was a fast runner. When we had a broad jump competition at school I only had to jump once because no one else could match my distance. At age 15 I was asked to be the pitcher on the city's adult baseball team. I threw with my left hand and fanned out many of the batters. I had to stop pitching after I injured my shoulder in a motorcycle accident. After I finished my schooling I worked for wages sometimes but liked the freedom of being my own boss as a hunter and trapper. The government paid me $6 for each pair of coyote ears. One job I had was driving truck to haul flour to the Navajo reservation. The key to having a successful trip was to navigate the dirt roads without getting stuck in a sandy wash. For a couple of years I worked as a mechanic at Lyman Service Station where I earned $40 per month. A girl named Mary Lake and I both moved to Grayson in 1910 and I learned to love her very much. My life changed drastically between 1930 and 1940. My dad had obtained a little three-room house on the east side of town from Porter's when they defaulted on a loan. Dad let Mary and me take over the home. The 1930 U.S. Census shows a happy little family of three, me, Mary and Grant, living next to the Marvin Jones family. It shows I am paying $5 per month rent and the Jones home is worth $600. The April 1940 census shows me with a new wife, Mabel Carroll, and five new children. Grant is now 11 years old and I also have Kay, Rex, Dean, and the twins, Merrill D. and Mary Lee. I worried a lot about providing for my family. Money was scarce. My world was rapidly changing. We had been in an economic depression for years and now Germany, Japan and Italy were on the war path. On September 16, 1940, the United States instituted the Selective Training and Service Act of 1940, which required all men between the ages of 21 and 45 to register for the draft. This was the first peacetime draft in United States history. I registered one month later. Now back to Mary. I had helped move the Lake family to Oakley, Utah and Mary's two younger sisters, Leora and Winifred had returned to Blanding to attend San Juan High School. Winifred, shown here, lived with us because she wanted to help tend Grant when Devan was born. When Mary suddenly died, my world was turned upside down. Thankfully, my sister-in-law Grace Powell Shumway, A's wife, cared for Devan until Bailey and Sarah Lake took him back to Oakley. This photo shows A and Grace with their son Keith and his two children Kelly and Kim. My parents helped take care of Grant when I was out trying to earn some money. I moved in with my parents so Grant would not be shuffled back and forth between houses. Before Mary died, I had a dream and I was sitting in a rocking chair at Grandma Shumway's, peeling an orange and feeding it to Grant. Several weeks after Mary had passed away, I suddenly realized I was sitting in that chair peeling an orange and feeding it to Grant. My brother Glenn married Eva Lyman in February 1931 and moved into the home Mary and I had been living in. I finally earned enough money to buy my own car so I could be more independent. It was a Model A Ford with a rumble seat. Trapping was hard work. Harris and I often had three different trap lines set in Utah, Arizona and Colorado as shown on this Google map. We had to hike through the wilderness with the stinky bait and traps as we looked for good places to set the traps. The traps each had a chain with a steel peg on it to secure the trap to the ground. We covered each trap with a camouflage of branches and leaves when we went back to check the line for coyotes we had to remember the places we had set the traps. In 1931 I started filing mining claims in Cottonwood Wash several miles west of Blanding. 
Along with my brothers I would dig and sell uranium and vanadium ore in the summer and trap coyotes in the winter. This later photo shows me with my sons K and Rex at a cottonwood mine entrance waiting for the noxious gases to clear after we light a round of dynamite. Years of trapping had required me to become familiar with the topography of thousands of acres in San Juan County which served me well when it came to finding deposits of uranium and vanadium ore. I could identify the Morrison and Shinarump formations in the Colorado Plateau. A dip in rock layer indicated an ancient river once flowed there. The highest grade ore was in the vegetation deposited on the river bends. This photo, taken in 1980, shows me at a cottonwood mine with my son Rex and grandchildren Katrina and Matthew. A friend of mine, Evan Carroll, takes credit for getting me interested in marrying Mary and another girl in town who was also born in Mexico. The girl was Mabel Carroll, Evan's sister. When I went to the Carroll home to see her she thought I was there to visit her brothers, Evan and Wayne. I finally convinced Mabel to marry me. In 1934 we took a winter time trip to Salt Lake City and were married in the temple on the 9th of February. The next December our first child was born and we named him Louis K. Because of my bad experience with baby doctors, I took Mabel to her Aunt Amy Black Carroll in Salt Lake to deliver K. He is shown here at about age 1. We had gone to Salt Lake at Thanksgiving time and I missed the birth of Kay because I was up at the lake home in Oakley. This photo shows Bailey and his cows and the van with his dog cub. Our transportation was my Model A Ford which had no heater. In an effort to keep Kay warm I cut a hole in the floor of the car, wrapped the exhaust manifold with tin and piped the warm air to the hole in the floor. At the far end of our lot my dad had been raising red foxes in a large pen made from chicken wire he sold fox hides and tails to clothing makers. After my father died in 1935 I took over the business but in a few years wearing furs went out of fashion. Our second child, Rex Wayne, was also born in Salt Lake in February of 1937 which required more winter trips to Salt Lake. Rex is about age one in this photo. Next we had Dean Carroll in August of 1938 and then twins Mary Lee and Merrill D. in November 1939. This photo shows Dean surrounded by Kay and Rex and the twins, called Buddy and Sisty. This photo shows me holding our next child, Howard Gaith, born in June of 1945. Grant is standing by me and Devan is standing by Mabel. Occasionally Grant lived with us and the van would come down for a visit. Most summers our whole family would drive the Salt Lake and stay a few days with Mabel's parents. I would always go to the lake home to visit my older children. Our last child, named Carol Ruth, was born in August 1952. She is age 3 in this photo. I am very proud of all nine of my children for pursuing additional education at a university. I was especially happy when Grant got a geology degree from the U and returned to Blanding with his family. Kay gave up his professorship at Washington State and brought his family back to Blanding. He and Patsy were a big help to us in our old age. I will continue my story. Mining was a big part of my life. I hope I do not bore you with some of the details. By 1939 I have been mining for over a decade. In 1939 I started mining in Long Canyon northeast of Blanding. I mined there and in Montezuma Canyon for several years before mining in White Canyon, Red Canyon, Elk Mountain, Shea Mountain and in Monument Valley. This photo shows Paul Black at his gas station. On top of the Red Texaco stand is a glass tube with gallon measuring marks on it. A manual lever allowed pumping the desired quantity of gas into the glass tube and then it could be drained down the hose into your car. Even though gasoline was rationed during World War II, since the uranium and vanadium minerals in my ore were critical to the war effort, I could buy all the gas I needed. It cost about 20 cents per gallon. Sadly, in 1941 my oldest brother, Sixtus, was killed by a cave-in at his Long Canyon mine five miles from the mine Harris and I were working at. His grandson Connie was working with Sixtus and ran the five miles to get help. Sixtus is the middle-seated person in this group of miners. He was the father of nine children. In 1964, Seth's son, 
Burdett, was also killed by a cave-in. This photo shows John Black at work. After drilling the holes he crimps an explosive cap on the end of the black fuse cable cut to the depth of the holes. He then slices a hole in the side of a stick of dynamite and inserts the cap. There may be many sticks per hole but only one needs a fuse. Cave-ins, dynamite and caps were just some of the dangers of mining. The lights attached to our hard hats were flames of acetylene gas lift by a flint sparker. Water in the upper tank dripped into the lower tank containing carbide granules which gave off gas. You had to make sure your little fire was out before handling gasoline. This photo shows my little miners, Howard and Carol, ready to go to work. Another more subtle danger was rock dust. Breathing it leads to silicosis of the lungs. Initially we drilled holes for the sticks of dynamite by hammering on a long steel chisel. We dragged the dust out of the hole with a long wooden spoon. In about 1945 we decided to make our mining less physically taxing. We bought an air compressor and an air-driven rotary drill like this old rusty tool. The tool was heavy to hold horizontally while we drilled. Later an adjustable height piston was developed to support the drill. It became known as a jackhammer. The drill rod had a hole down the middle and a replaceable bit on the end. We could move a lever to blow the dust out of the hole but dust came back into our face. Later a small water tank attached to the air hose caused the grit to flow out of the hole as mud. I had a Ford dump truck that we shoveled the ore into during the day. If we had 5 or 6 tons in the truck by the end of the day I would drive it to a mill in Durango or Natarita, Colorado and get back home about 11 p.m. I would often take one of my sons with me. In 1942 this mill was built in Monticello. Many Blanding men worked in this mill. From 1949 till 1953 I could also take my ore to a mill built west of Elk Mountain just south of the Height Ferry across the Colorado River. The only operating mill today in the USA is the one here a few miles south of town. We found an outcropping of high-grade uranium near the top of the monument in Monument Valley. After much struggle, Wayne, Evan, Harris, and I set up a very long steel cable system. We would dig the uranium, put it in a sack and send it sliding down the cable to the bottom. It was about a two-mile hike to go from our base camp around to the back side, climb up the cliffs and back around to the vein of ore. In the summer of 1955 I decided to take my family to California to see the ocean and the LA Temple. This photo shows Howard, Mary Lee, Rex, Carol, and me by the LA Temple. The LA traffic scared me so much I let Rex drive. Later I drove myself to this temple twice more, once when Rex was married and once when D. Van's daughter Mary was married. Before the uranium boom ended in the 1950s uranium miners filed a class action lawsuit against the mill owners. They had been paying miners only for the vanadium. With the money I received, I added a living room and kitchen to the house. Now Mabel had an electric stove to cook on. The old kitchen became a bedroom. Later Howard took this photo of his pickup parked in front of our enlarged home. Harris and I decided to quit mining and started cutting and selling building stones like those shown in this photo of a planting area on our house. This photo shows Harris stacking rocks and K and I cutting rocks at our sales yard north of town. We provided the stone for the Blanding Library and sold many tons of stone to people from Colorado. Eating lunch at the rock quarry on Elk Mountain are me, Howard and Carol. The boom truck and hydraulic power stone cutter are our main tools. During my lifetime I served three church missions. From 1943 to 1947 I taught the gospel of Jesus Christ to people between Bluff, Utah and Dove Creek, Colorado. In 1969 Mabel and I were called on a two-year stake mission. In 1973 we were called to serve in the Southwest Indian Mission. I bought a pickup to travel to the towns we were assigned to on the reservation. We served the Navajos in Shanto, Denahotso, and Chilchinbeto. We loved teaching the good news. One of my favorite times of year was deer season. I hunted with my boys and Mabel's brothers. Here I am in 1983 with my red hat. Dean's family was with us in 1983 and Scott took videos. This screenshot from the video shows me, Dean and Mabel. Mabel will tell you more about our family after she tells about her growing up years. Hello, my name is Mabel Carroll. I was born in Colonia Pacheco, Chihuahua, Mexico in May of 1911. Shown in these photos are my father, James Franklin Carroll, and mother, Mary Bell Black, with their son, Charles Thomas. The Carrolls and Blacks came to Mexico from Orderville, Utah. Both James and Mary's fathers had more than one wife and later James married a second wife named Annie Eliza Burrell. 
This photo shows my parents late in life. My mother had 12 children. Four died as babies and Charles died from the 1918 flu on board a troop ship headed for Europe. Aunt Annie had nine. Only Rose died as a baby. Dutton was killed in New Guinea in World War II. This photo shows Aunt Annie standing between her son, Lester and her husband. On the right is Beth. The left three are Tom, Willard, and Thel. My father had built this nice seven-room brick home where I was born and after being in Mexico for 20 years, things were looking up. However, a civil war broke out and we were forced to flee back to the USA. We chose to go to Grayson, Utah where Grandma Charlotte and several of her children lived. We arrived in Grayson in September of 1912 and, for several months, lived in tents on Uncle Tom's land southeast of town. The weather seemed very cold to Pachecoites. To add to our food supply we always had animals and gardens. Here I am at about age 8 hoeing weeds in the garden. The blue mountain shows in the background. When I was age 14 mother sent my brother, Klein, and me to the barn to catch the chickens and put them in their coop. I lunged for a chicken and was deeply poked in the groin by a pitchfork handle. The wound was very painful. It swelled up and got puss in it, the surface finally healed but the hip joint was infected. That slowed the bone growth and plagued me for years. Sometimes I would resort to using crutches. Entertainment was scarce in those days. At about age 14 I began to perform publicly quoting poems. I was following the example of my father, James, and his father, Willard. I started performing the poem called Betty and the Bear which Dad taught me. We pronounced bear as bar. Betty was strong and killed the bar. When I started the 10th grade I also signed up for Albert R. Lyman's religion class. He asked me to start teaching a religion class for 3rd graders. During that year I taught children faith promoting stories with songs and prayer. During the Christmas holidays I enjoyed going to a dance every night. On the piano would be Lucy Harris or Mamie Adams with Hiram Porter on the violin. Boys I usually danced with were Anthon or Melvin Black or Clifton Hawkins or Aaron Harvey. We hide high school classes and graduation in the church house. The building was sometimes referred to as the San Juan Stake Tabernacle. It was built in 1915. This photo of me was taken about the time of my high school graduation. I wanted to get a two-year college degree so I could get a job teaching school. I went to Salt Lake and lived with Uncle Tom and Aunt Amy, registered for classes and found a job working in a cafe at night. After a while I had to drop my classes because I just could not keep up. I worked there for almost two years and the cafe burnt down. I decided to go back to Blandon. Lee came over in a casual way many times. He would ask me to go with him to look at his trap lines, or look at the Shumway livestock or just to ride down to Browns Canyon. In 1933 I had my appendix removed in the Moab Hospital. I was there for several days. Lee visited me many hours and when I got out we planned our marriage. We married in February and I soon became pregnant. The larger the baby got the more painful my hip joint became. I went to see Dr. Allen in Moab and he recommended I have my female organs removed or else I would die. I rejected the idea. As Lee has told you, we made several more trips to Salt Lake during the next few years. This 1942 photo shows us with my brother, Wayne, and his new wife, Mary Westover. In 1939 we used the Homestead Act to obtain 160 acres of land in Bullpup Canyon. This is the small house we built and lived in part-time to fulfill the requirements. Years later, when Kay and Patsy came to Blanding they planted a large orchard on the land. Two of our favorite family photos are of the twins at about age three on the front steps. They showed no interest in photos. After some hugging they settled down. This photo shows Lee and me in the middle of some of my siblings and their children. My mother is between Evan and Winifred on the right. This photo shows me with my sister, Dolly, between Evan and Mayo on the left and Evan and Lester on the right. During World War II, Lee followed the war news very closely. Our Philco radio included shortwave reception.
The whole family loved to listen to Fibber McGee and Molly on Tuesday nights. Lee and the boys also listened to BYU basketball games. This 1948 photo shows me holding Howard out by the garden with my crutch in the wagon. This photo shows all my kids on Christmas morning the year Carol was born, 1952. I took this 1954 photo when we were out gathering pine nuts. Details of this panorama can be viewed in my family tree memories. Its basic point is that I had a loving spouse and supportive children. Lee placed a pulley in my laundry room and one on top of the barn. By opening a window I could stand in the laundry room, pin wet clothes to the steel wire that ran between the two pulleys and put my wash out to dry. In 1969 we all gathered for Thanksgiving at Rex and Linda's home in Idaho Falls. Whenever the grandkids came to town, Lee would give them a joy ride in his 1954 Jeep. Annually our grandchildren went to Corn Cob Hollow to see the 1,000-year-old apartments used by the Anasazi Indians. The cave feels nice and cool after a hike in the hot sun. In 1974 my children took me back to Pacheco where I saw our old church and house and visited the cemetery. I loved working with the Sisters in Relief Society throughout my adult life. Even when old we grew a garden. Here is a photo of Lee picking tomatoes in about 1980. In 1984 we celebrated our 50th anniversary at the Hotel Utah with our children and their spouses. We were thrilled that Devan came to see us in 1987. We gathered at Buddy and Kay's place. In December 1987 Dean suddenly died in Oklahoma's city from a brain aneurysm. Lee was in the Monticello Hospital and too weak to attend the wonderful funeral we held for Dean. Dean's family had visited us a few months earlier. Lee's words to descendants who visited him after Dean's funeral were, Honor the priesthood. Lee died two weeks after Dean from silicosis of the lungs. I am thankful we got to be in the temple with Lee earlier in the year. I lived four more years with several of my children. Howard and Becky let me and Harris' wife Esther and her sister, Edith, live in a small home behind their family home in South Jordan. The three of us set temple attendance goals and were able to offer proxy ordinances for dozens of people. One experience I remember when living with Merrill and Kay regards prayer. I was getting weaker and once explained to Merrill I wanted help kneeling in prayer to hone her father in heaven. I only had to stay two weeks in a care facility before dying. I made sure I paid my tithing first. The back of our headstone is also beautiful with the names of all nine of Lee's children. Till we meet again, choose to believe in God and His Son Jesus Christ. Show your belief by your kind words and acts of service. Love Mabel